going to talk a little bit about mural history um, and the beginnings leading up all the way to where we are now, um, even though there will be a couple of lectures focusing more specifically on the Renaissance mural, uh, the contemporary mural, as well as uh, mural techniques, um, this will be sort of a very condensed version, like I said. So humans have been painting murals since time immemorial. Um, these are murals that have been found in caves. There have been murals found in caves all across France and Spain. Some of these date back 35,000 years, even more. Um, and I really think that they showcase the sort of breadth and visual vocabulary that is still prevalent today. Uh, it's interesting that people can witness these and thoroughly understand the narratives that they might actually be utilizing. This image here is just a kind of joke image of uh, a... Uh, <laughs> of a, a sort of a warehouse, but the actual images themselves, um, if I'm showing something that's going on or ha had been painted uh, in the case of Lascaux, when that was opened up, uh, there were so many viewers that um, cons conservationists found that the breath condensation started to really uh, degrade the surfaces. And so the only way that we can actually experience a, these caves now is ultimately through um, photos, film, and recreation. So there is a recreation of the caves of Lascaux um, so that visitors can actually make a pilgrimage to see them. And what they really do uh, focus on is essentially the livelihoods of people, of early people, um, which would have been the hunt. Um, and yes, that is an early sort of rhinoceros. Um, so, what you're seeing here are the Chauvet Caves, and the Chauvet Caves were actually found in 1994, and they were discovered by uh, hikers uh, behind a concealed passageway. Um, this is yet another cave that has been sealed off um, because of damage, and so you can only see this uh, in replica or in photographs. A mural painting is essentially applied directly to a wall in its purest form. Um, it is generally made integral with that surface of a wall or a ceiling. Um, it can be in, in terms of a, uh, executed in terms of a fresco, which is part of the plaster, or it can be painted directly onto that wall. Although the definition of mural painting has really expanded in the 20th and 21st century. Um, the term, generally, uh, properly, it, it, it includes a painting on, on it, it can be fired tiles, um, it can be a mosaic, uh, but it, the mosaic forms the sort of overall scheme of the painting, so it's just another technique in this permanent installation on a flat space that uh, does contend with and wrestle with the architecture. Here we have an early example of a wall painting in Teo, Teotihuacan, Mexico, um, which would have been painted by indigenous peoples. A lot of these historic murals and frescoes have actually been skimmed from the actual spaces they originally inhabited. And that's a whole other conversation about the ethics of um, artifact mining. Um, but this you can actually see at view uh, on the metro at the Metropolitan Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, and that little date there is wrong. It's actually 550 CE, so. You can also experience mural painting um, in a very grandiose form uh, as example by those in Pompeii. And of course, most of you know that um, in you know 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius um, in Pompeii exploded and it killed 20,000 people of the city and covered the entire place in ash, deep, deep ash. And what that did is it, it preserved the spaces. Um, and they, they completed these frescoes in the sort of bon, bon fresco technique, which means painting pigment onto wet plaster so that they literally become part of the walls. 
And believe it or not, the Romans were known for their painting uh, contemporaneously more than their sculptures. And most people don't know, but their sculptures, those white marble sculptures you're all familiar with, were actually painted. Um, it's just been lost throughout time and age. So these paintings would have depicted all sorts of things. It would have decorated the, uh, the, the houses of, of the sort of middle class as well as the upper classes um, as a means to sort of create um, a, a reflection of the values of its people as well as just sort of provincial images that depict the everyday. When I say mural painting or when I say fresco, the first thing that'll prop into most people's heads is um, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel which is, of course, you know, is where the new popes are elected, and, of course, masses are still done today. Um, and what's interesting to note is that over the course of many, many years after this was painted, due to candle soot and just general um, pollution from the air, just, you know, cars, um, this became really, really sort of damaged and so there was an extensive cleaning done over the period of several mm -hmm. years um, in which conservators and art historians went in and painstakingly removed uh, that material with very simple um, sort of soap and water approach um, and here's a really interesting picture that I find um, touches on the scale of what this um, would have been what would have been like painting um, and I want you to note the sort of extreme foreshortening going on. All of this would have been considered by Michelangelo um, from the vantage point of a viewer below. Around-ish the same time, we have Leonardo da Vinci exploring various techniques of the, f of the mural and at the fresco um, on his Last Supper. And of course, most of you know that the Last Supper is really degrading at this point. Um, because while he was painting this, he decided to sort of bridge in and you know, loop in the approaches that he was learning in the studio with traditional oil painting with the plaster work, the wet plaster work. And of course, about 10 years after this was completed, it started to fall apart. And so it's a, a real feat for art historians and art conservators to sort of keep it um, in good condition. And not to mention, they have a limited amount of viewers per day because of the because of the damage done by just simply the wear and tear of having that many people in a space. What the Renaissance did is sort of moved away in the late Renaissance, moved away from the mural as the sort of predominant modes of of image um, depiction, and it did that because of the transportability of the canvas. Uh, Large-scale canvases could now be completed in the studio, uh, they could be transported, and they could be installed. And these could simply be stitched together to be in the mural form, very, very large. And of course, this time allowed for artists to really expand the technical uh, possibilities of, 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 of the reflection and refraction that happens um, as a result of glazing and all the techniques that you, you learn as painters. The most interesting and beautiful um, mural I have ever seen um, was a series of murals in the Vatican. And it's uh, uh, an apartment that essentially is in the Vatican um, tour and would have been a part of the Vatican housing that you see shortly before you actually walk into the Sistine Chapel. So running from east to west, uh, this is the, the this is the Raphael rooms or the Raphael rooms, and you would have entered the apartment running from east to west. Um, this is known as the Stanze, and this is a series of frescoes in which the rooms of four different um, depictions or four different sort of heroes, the Hall of Constantine, the Room of Hellorodorus. Hello um, the room of Signatura, and the room of the fire in the Borgo, like the, the Borgias, um, would depict all these varying narratives, one of which you're already familiar with, which is the School of Athens over there to the right. Um, 
as commonly called the stanze or stanzas, um, they were originally intended as a suite of apartments uh, for Pope Julius II. Um, he, he asked Raphael to do these. And then, you know, at the time, he, Raphael was a very young artist from Urbino. Um, and he was asked to redecorate these existing interiors of the rooms in their entirety. Um, it was probably Julius's intent to outshine the apartments of his predecessor, the you know, Pope Alexander IV. Um, and the standa, stanze are actually directly above Alexander's Borgia apartment. Um, they're on the third floor, and they overlook, uh, you know, the south side of the Belvedere courtyard. So it's a really prime location to um, to really sort of stand out and, and really truly in their color and in their light and in their depiction of, of, of forms in the round, this is the most stunning fresco I have ever seen. It, it, it far outshined the Sistine Chapel, which I found to be actually very brown in color. And let me fast forward into the sort of new resurgence of the mural. And the new resurgence of the mural really sort of was brought on by um, the Mexican Revolution in the 1920s. Um, they installed or developed a socialist government. And remember that socialism is different than communism. Um, socialism is a, an ideology and, and communism is a, a type of governance that is, is very authoritarian and is not typically democratic. Um, and these were socially democratic people. And so um, Diego Rivera um, was, was sort of the heavy hitter during this era. But around that time, three art artists, Mexican artists, actually arose to um, great prominence. And they were called Los, um, Los Tres Grandes. And Los Tres Grandes were um, Jose Clemente Orozco, as well as, um, and there's another Orozco, and we'll go back and talk about that, but um, Siqueiros, David Siqueiros. Um, so Orozco was very much sort of in the uh, sort of vein of a sort of cubist approach, as were the other two, to be frank. Um, these Mexican muralists really did seek to reflect the ideas and the new era of um, the Mexican potential as a country, um, as it revolved and changed. Um, this particular um, image, a, a mural that, that is done at the um, National Preparatory School, um, which had a fantastic art program, is called the destruction of the new of the old order. And so what we have is the, the, the men who are representative in the front there of this um, revolutionary figures looking back at the detritus or the debris of the old order itself, those values, leaving them behind, moving forward and progressing. Siqueiros was more of a um, sort of populist painter and really did focus on the sort of voice of the under, um, undervalued, um, the proletariat, as a sort of, you know, socialist um, nomenclature would refer to the sort of everyday, everyday man, the field worker, the industry worker, um, and he would dis depict them in a way that really did honor um, their platform, their struggle, and their voice. Um, around the time of the Great Depression, um, these sort of robber barons, uh, these very, very you know, wealthy industry moguls in the United States started building. And uh, John D. Rockefeller started to build Rockefeller Plaza, which is 30 Rock uh, today in New York City. Um, and it, this started in the, the early 30s. He commissioned Diego Rivera after a retrospective that was done at MoMA, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, to do a mural that focused on these values that really started to become the driving force of moving Americans out of the Great Depression, which was primarily focused on industry and capitalism. So Diego Rivera created this, uh, and originally it was titled Man at the Crossroads, and it was done in 1933, um, and it depicts a sort of atomic world 
um, that really is about these sort of three figures in one uh, uh, in the center focus um, of the sort of building blocks of America. And in it, you see war. And in it, you see the proletariat. And in it, you see the atomic age. And you also, very closely, if you look closely, see portraits of a Rockefeller and his family, as well as a portrait to the right of the man in the middle of Vladimir Lenin. And Rockefeller was very, uh, they found this very troubling. Uh, it seemed antithetical to the values of capitalism and the sort of building up his industry. And so um, Diego Rivera said he'd rather see the image destroyed than altered after he was asked to change that portrait. Um, and so he, Diego Rivera was fired and the image was covered up and then uh, eventually chipped off. Um, so this is a marvelous work of art and what it actually is depicting is the recreation of that mural. It was recreated again by Diego Rivera, uh, uh, re-entitled Controller of the Universe, and that's on display at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. Um, and so the story of the original mural's creation and its destruction is sort of the focus on um, a major exhibit depicting this work. Um, and so what we have here is the early sketches of that image that was indeed approved by the Rockefellers and the board, um, but it was indeed altered by Diego Rivera while he was working on it to do to essentially depict those th that imagery. Um, and what is that? Essentially Marxist revolution. And of course this is during the time of of great um, suspicion and really vitriol against um, the communists and any red values of you know, essentially Russia or the growing spread of communist um, ideology. Replacing that was actually Jose Maria Sertz. Um, and this is called, so this is still there today, um, done directly over the, the destroyed uh, Rivera um, fresco. It's called American Progress, AKA the Triumph of Man's Accomplishments Through Physical and Mental Labor, which is really sort of a benign reflection of um, American um, ingenuity, but done so in a way that really is aggrandizing. And really that, 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 that is an argument that sort of touches on propagandistic uh, values. And really, I mean, that's what private mural commissions often depict is a sort of um, very, very political um, agency. Ben Shahn, an American artist who actually worked as an assistant to Diego Rivera on his Rockefeller mural, uh, he was a Jewish Lithuanian immigrant uh, brought over uh, in his childhood. Um, and he, his hometown was essentially called the Jer Jersey Homestead. Um, it's now since been named the, the city, uh, Roosevelt, New Jersey. And it was founded as a place that essentially relocated Jewish garment workers from New York City during the Great Depression. Um, and he created this image, which was really sort of taking after Diego Rivera, as you see. It, it depicts the struggles and the mass exodus of, from Jews from New York. And it also included portraits of his personal mother and family and Albert Einstein. Um, and it, it, it really does sort of touch on uh, being for and about the community, which is really what um, the mural essentially is about, which is uh, incorporating its community to engage with the arts on a daily basis um, so that these values really are sort of markers of um, our purpose um, as a nationalistic identity. During the Great Depression, uh, FDR instituted the um, Works Progress Administration, uh, known as the WPA. And in it, he started the Federal Art Project, and it was an initiative through the New Deal to fund the visual arts in the United States. Um, and that's actually a mistake there, that image is not Ivan Albright. But 
It was an ambitious employment and infrastructure program. Um, it was created in 1935, and it was really during the bleakest years of the Great Depression. Of course, it, as you can imagine, artists and craftspeople were completely unemployable at that time. Um, and over the eight years of its existence, the WPA actually put about eight, eight and a half million Americans to work. Um, there were about, uh, I think, 2,500 murals painted in various buildings across the country, lots of them being um, federal buildings and post offices. And as you can imagine, this started to catch on um, after the World War, um, after the Second World War, and with the rise of civil rights um, and, of course, lost voices in American history, we started to see city murals crop up. And what we have here is um, called the Wall of Respect, and that's a little misspelling there. This, this one is created by William Walker, and you'll note the date there, 1967, so it really is at the culmination of tensions and racial divide in the United States. Um, so this was, this was a mural first painted during that era, but it sort of grew. Um, and it was by the visual arts workshop of the Organization of Black American Culture, so OBAC. Um, the mural represented, you know, the contributions of, of uh, about 14 designers. Um, it had photographers and painters, um, and it really depicts a sort of um, vision of black excellence. Um, Bill E. Holliday's depicted in there, John Coltrane, MLK, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, and it, it eventually it grew to actually being painted on um, the building uh, directly across from it, and all these are on kind of dilapidated buildings, really neglected, um, and the city found this to be a, a threat because this became the location of organization and black protest. And so a couple of years after this was completed, I believe it was 1971, there was a mysterious fire that burned down the building. So you see that the sort of political agency and reflection in these images becomes a great, a great, I think, moniker and point, a, a pivot point to cultural conversations of the communities. Um, over in LA, at around the same time, so 1976, Judy Baca started a very ambitious project called the Great Wall. And this is the longest mural in the world. And this is just two segments of it. So the Great Wall of Los Angeles, um, designed by her, uh, it was executed with the help of about 400 community youth and artists. Uh, during the summers um, and, and, you know, and, and throughout the year. And it was coordinated by the Social and Public Art Resources Center. So by the community itself funded and, you know, organized as a sort of project by the inhabitants of the local community. So it was Baca's actual first mural and Sparks, um, so the Social and Public Art Resource Center, their first public art project in and of itself of many. Um, and it's, it's, the official title of it is called The History of California, and it really touches on the sort of popularity of the Chicano um, mural renaissance of L.A. around this period, because it had been happening for a long period of time. Fast forward a little bit. Uh, actually, no, it's around the same time. We have the rise of Saul LeWitt as a minimalist, modernist artist, and he, he, he became very famous to for doing these sort of internal murals. Um, this is called Wall Drawing 289. And what he would do is he would send instructions with essentially a formula for how to create these artworks. He didn't create them himself. The museum, museum staff did. I actually have a friend who recreated one of these over in, uh, at the museum in Austin. And he was really well known for a quote that, that, that says, the idea becomes the machine that makes the art. And what that touches on is really um, th that idea or con the concept is the driving force of the process. And the process dictates the visual aesthetic or the visual experience that the viewer um, with beholds. And 
the next image I have of his is is really sort of touching on that that that, that instructional manual focus. So this is wall drawing eleven. Um, I believe it's at uh, MoMA as well. I think um, this is this is these instructions were a wall divided horizontally and vertically into four equal parts. Within each part, three of the four kinds of lines are superimposed. So I have the um, step back photograph. And then I have the close-up there in the lower left-hand corner of what that actually looks like. It's just completed with um, pencil, usually, or a, a acrylic paint. And for this lecture, we'll end on um, the work of Keith Haring, who I opened with as well. Um, and this is a lesser-known Keith Haring work. Many of you are already familiar with what he's done, but he was really prolific. And he his life was short-lived, so I'm, I'm really glad he was, because... This is a multi-story uh, Tutamundo mural. Um, it's in Pisa, and it's on the side of a church, um, the Church of Santa Antonio. And it's, it's just near a train station. And it's somewhat ironic because it's the last public mural of this openly gay artist um, and prominent AIDS activist. And it's ironic because it's painted on the side of a church, um, and he died of AIDS. So... The work, titled Tutto Mundo, was, it means all world, and it was completed in just eight months before Herring uh, died of AIDS-related complications in 1990. So we'll end there, and uh, in the coming weeks, we will continue on with mural history, as well as the focus on um, the materials and more contemporary voices of where mural painting stands today. That's all for now. Thank you.